Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Metro Detroit Book and Author Society Spring Series. I'm Kathy Russ, and I have the joy of being the president of the Book and Author Society. And for those of you who may be joining us tonight for the first time, a little background. The Metro Detroit Book and Author Society is a nonprofit organization, and we support books, reading, authors, literacy, all the things that we all who are here tonight love so much. Our major fundraisers were our luncheons that were held two times per year, but obviously due to COVID, we are not able to do that. So, um, so we've transitioned to virtual events and I'm just so delighted that so many of, of you are joining us tonight. We have our highest attendance tonight for our, our author, Sarah Penner, who's with us tonight, our special guest. So it's very exciting. Um, but we hope you'll support the society by signing up for our newsletter and following us on social media so you can keep up with all that we're doing to support authors and books and bring you all these great authors. So before we get started, I do want to give a special shout out to the Cromaine Library for hosting this program on their Zoom account. Thanks to the Cromaine Library, we were able to allow um, more than our usual participants. We have 102 people signed up tonight. So thank you, Cromaine. Um, all the book lovers are in good company tonight. So our special guest tonight is New York Times bestselling author, Sarah Penner, who wrote the fabulous, fabulous, The Lost Apothecary. And the way that our program works is Sarah and I are gonna chat for a little while, but we have allowed a, a lot of time for your questions. Um, we've disabled the chat feature, so you can ask your questions in the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen, and you can ask them and ask questions anytime throughout the program. You can start start firing them off now if you'd like to. Um, and about halfway through, um, we'll start taking your questions and make sure that we answer as many of them as we can. So now to our special guest, Sarah Penner. Welcome, Sarah. How are you tonight? Hi, Kathy. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Lynette, as well for coordinating this. And then, of course, thank you to everyone who's tuning in on a Monday night. Yes, yes. And and just, you know, that so many people would would zoom up. It's, it's <laughs> pretty cool. I know. I think we all have a little bit of uh, virtual fatigue at this point, but it is nice that the industry has kind of shifted and we're we're here now. And so we can make this happen even as things start to reopen in the world. Yeah, I, it's one thing. Um, I, I don't mind the Zoom so much when I'm doing things like this. You know, meetings at work, maybe I'm a little Zoomed out, but when I get to talk to to my favorite authors, it's just it's just a lot of fun. Yep, I forget yep. I forget the screen. The screen. <laughs> so, so I want to get right to it because I, I there's a lot um, I'm sure that our audience wants to know about, and there's certainly a lot that I want to ask you about. But Sarah, The Lost Apothecary was called one of the most anticipated books of 2021, and that was not I mean that was by Goodreads, by Oprah, by Newsweek, Good Housekeeping. I mean the list goes on, and it was a number one library reads pick, and it's been on the New York Times bestseller list for the last seven weeks. This is your first book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you have any idea what the response was going to be to this book? Uh, gosh, Kathy. So it's, it's funny when you, so much has happened in the last few months and when you read the accolades and I sort of hear it all at once, um, it's pretty amazing and pretty powerful. To answer your question, uh, if I had any idea that this was going to happen, I'll say this, and you know, Lynette is, um, she's on the, the publishing team. And so she gets some insight as well, but, um, there was a lot of buzz and a lot of resources and a lot of promotion that my wonderful publisher, Park Row Books and Harlequin put towards the, uh, the publicity of the, of the book before it even launched. And I mean, really the publicity started a full year before the story came out. So, I mean, we're talking March, 2020 and, uh, this whole time, I was so thrilled that my publisher was doing this, but it also puts a lot of pressure on the author because you can't help but think, what if on March 2nd, this thing comes out and it just sort of flops or it does mediocre. And uh, when, I, when my editor called me the very first week it hit the New York Times bestseller list, I was elated, yes. And I, I was experiencing all of these very happy emotions but I was in the car uh, with my husband and the, the main uh, feeling that I felt at the time was just relief 
because my publisher, I felt like they had done so much and we finally had crested the mountain and we had accomplished the number one thing you can really accomplish in novel writing. I mean, short of like a, a you know, some huge book award uh, or like a Pulitzer, but this is what, uh, this is what we were all striving for and, and kind of didn't even want to say out loud that we hoped that it would hit the list. But of course, deep down, we all did. And so when it hit the list the first week, I was just so relieved and elated. And then it hit the second week and I was like, wow, that's really cool. And then it did it the third week and the fourth week and the fifth week. And then last week was the sixth week. And, um, at this point, it's just almost like, I, I get these calls from my editor on Wednesday nights and I just kind of sit there in, in shock and I laugh because it's comical at this point that so many people have loved this book enough to tell their family and their friends and strangers and the support from booksellers and librarians has just been incredible. And so I, I some days just wake up and think like, when am I going to wake up from the stream? But then I don't, it just, the day goes on and uh, so I'm so grateful and to, to Park Row Books and to readers everywhere who keep talking about it. And I just really am so thankful at this point. Well, and one of the things, you know, when I did a little bit of research um, and I want, you know, I'll let you talk about your background, but, um, but you grew up in a log cabin in Kansas mm -hmm. and you have a finance background. And I guess that's not what I expected from an author who set a book in the, you know, the 18th century in London and with, you know, some of the, the mysterious and eerie things that go on in the book, it just seemed a little bit, um, I, I wasn't expecting it. So yeah. how, how do you explain that? How did this come about? It's kind of an eclectic background. You're right. I did. I grew up in a two bedroom log cabin and I, I don't mean like a facade made of log. I mean, like it was an actual log cabin in the woods in Northeast Kansas on three acres with a Creek in the back. And when I was younger, I would um, go hunt for like lizards and frogs in the river. So and I mean, yeah, I had a kind of an unusual background or childhood, I should say, uh, learned independence very quickly. I often journaled the things that I was seeing in the woods around my house, always have had an interest in words and language. But then when I went to uh, the University of Kansas, I quickly, I mean, I, so many of us can relate to this, but I realized I'm in college because I need to get a degree that will get me a good job so I can pay my bills. Um, that's the world that we live in. And so I remember having a conversation with my parents and not to say that they didn't support um, the arts or, or passions or what have you, but they, any parents going to want their kid to graduate with a good job. And so I very much felt um, pulled towards Sarah, what are your strengths that can um, also, you know, put food on the table. And so I have always been also good at math and I really like numbers and I like data and analyzing information. So I went the finance route and lo and behold, I got a really good job out of college. And I, I did work in finance for 13 years. And I would say about halfway through that tenure, uh, when I was still living in Kansas, cause I live in Florida now, but when I was living in Kansas, um, I felt that there was just something unfulfilled and I've always been a, a little bit of an introspective soul searcher. And as I was kind of digging, like what is unfulfilled, this was in my late twenties, um, where I realized was I, I wasn't really creating or using that playful imaginative side when I was at work, you know, crunching numbers all day and, and talking to CEOs. I just, that's, that's so logical and left brained. But we as humans, I think are meant to also be really playful and have fun with art or music or writing or what have you. And so I enrolled in a uh, creative writing class and it was actually a nonfiction class, but each week we were required to submit these short essays that we would then workshop with other people in the class. And I immediately felt like it had started to fill this desire in me that I wasn't currently tapping into. And that was language and writing and some of these things that I had liked as a child, actually. And so I, I took several classes and then I decided, um, why not? I'm going to try and write a book, like an actual novel length project. And I, I learned because there really is, um, there's theory to the structure of stories. And I'm sure many people have heard of like a three act play or a three act story structure. 
And while, while, you know, that sounds kind of formulaic, most stories do follow that. And so I studied that. I, I played with this first book um, that was never agented, never published, but it taught me how to write a book and it taught me how to develop a character arc and how to craft a scene. So I did all of that. This was in my late twenties and I tried to get an agent with that story, but I was rejected by more than 130 agents. And so of course it was never published. So I was determined and I, um, I tried again and that second attempt was and is the lost apothecary. And you mentioned Kathy, um, how, how strange it was because it's set in London and kind of historical, but interestingly through my work in finance in corporate America, they sent me over to London like 10 or 15 times. And so I, on the evenings and weekends, I would go walk all of these old alleyways and do these tour, these tour, very touristy things like tours. Um, and I loved London from the, the moment I set foot in it and started reading a lot of historical fiction set in London, like Philippa Gregory, which I'm sure um, many on this call have heard of. So anyways, it, it's like everything, it was just kind of a confluence of these childhood interests and independence these travel experiences I had working in finance, but then also an unfulfilled need to create. And all of that just kind of collided. And the result is the lost path carry. Well, and I, I want to give you a compliment or pass on a compliment. I was talking to a friend of mine the other night and we were talking about this book and I, you know, I said, I get to interview Sarah Fenner. And she said, um, she said, I loved that book. And I said, I did too, but what did you love about it? And she said, it's not like anything else out there. And it's such a genre defying book. And so, you know, and I thought about that and I thought, and, and now, you know, every, you know, what you're saying about everything colliding, it, it kind of, um, I don't want to say it makes sense, but it's, it's how wonderful that everything could come together and form this fantastic book. Because when I was thinking about it, I thought, well, it's, it's, part historical fiction, it's part mystery, it's about friendship, it's about finding your passion, mm -hmm. it's about three extraordinary women, but like how, and I, because I was thinking like, how should I introduce this book? And then I thought, well, I'm going to let Sarah introduce this book. So like, how would you summarize this book? Yes. Who haven't read it yet. Sure. So I'll give you a short little elevator pitch, and then I'll tell you in terms of genre where I would slot it on a bookshelf. So the elevator pitch is it's uh, The Lost Apothecary is about a female apothecary in 18th century London who sells well-disguised poisons to women seeking vengeance on the men who have wronged them. And 200 years later in present day London, a woman finds an, uh, like a small kind of mysterious apothecary vial. And she thinks that she has found the culprit in the never solved apothecary murders that haunted London 200 years earlier. So we get to watch as both of these women's uh, stories progress. And then at the end, of course, not no spoilers tonight, but their fates collide and in a really interesting and um, unique way. So as it relates to the genre, and this is, this actually kind of makes for a funny story because I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Kathy, but this was a, a book of the month pick for March, 2021 and book of the month is a huge um, subscription service. And the day that they put the book up on their site, they had it listed as fantasy. And then about 72 hours later, they had changed it to historical fantasy and I thought that was so funny because if book of the month, who's been around for, I think like almost a hundred years, doesn't know how to slot a book in terms of its genre, how can any of us know? But I think it's actually kind of, it makes, it makes for an interesting story because I would say um, if I had to choose the, the most broad general genre, I would say historical fiction, but you don't pick up The Lost Apothecary because you want to learn about 18th century London. There are a few street scenes. We see a little bit about what people are doing and talking about. There's zero men uh, mention of the royal family or any monarchs at the time. There's no, not a single uh, real character, um, a real person in the book. They're all fictional characters. So you don't pick the book up to learn history. And so, you know, I say historical fiction, but then if I want to whittle it down, I would say historical mystery, historical thriller. But then there's also this huge element of magical realism in there as well. And the speculative element, 
So it really is like just a blend. Uh, and I hate to say mishmash cause that's, that's got a negative connotation, but it's a blend of a lot of different, um, genres. And, uh, I, I tend to lean towards historical thriller though, because the, the book is very fast paced. I purposely leave, I'd say well over half of the chapters, I, I've left them on a cliffhanger to, to keep the reader turning the pages. That's very strategic. And uh, I also just like writing thriller-esque type stories. So I, I kind of have branded myself as um, a writer of feminist historical thrillers. So that's what I like to call it. I love that description. I think it's great. But, you know, I will tell you that one of the things that struck me is I thought it was a very um, sensual book. I mean, clearly you did your research, but you're a very descriptive, very visual writer. I mean, I felt like I could see like when when Caroline goes mudlarking, I felt like I could feel the squishy mud and the 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 alley, the back alley, the dark, creepy, dank alley and then I felt like um with the apothecary I could smell the peppermint tea and I could mm-hmm. see the herbs and if you haven't read it there's a scene where beetles get ground into a powder um for some mischief and but I felt like I could see it and mm-hmm. I I mean so in addition to the story I think it does evoke it, it's a sens- sensual you know you can see taste feel Right. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I thank you for saying that. I think w- in one of my revision passes, I specifically was going for specificity and sensory detail. And so on every single page, I wanted to make sure I had captured what is my character hearing, smelling, tasting, seeing, feeling. Um, and I like that exercise because when you're writing, when you're drafting a story and you're just trying to get down where are they? What are they doing? And who's there? Um, you're not necessarily going to be thinking like, oh, how did the peppermint tea taste on her tongue? <laughs> but like later, once I've slowed it down and I have the scene constructed, um, then it's sort of fun to go back through and you almost um, envision it like a movie and you're trying to think like, you know, I see the steam rising from the mugs. So I'm going to describe that. Um, but I also like to do it with a light touch. You know, I think there are some books where you, you flip it open to a random page and there's three dense paragraphs on the color of someone's hair, you're never going to find that in one of my books. And in fact, my editor had to ask me like, what do these people even look like? Cause I didn't mention it the first time because I just, I just don't really care what they look like. I more care what they're doing and um, what crisis they're running from or trying to deal with at the time. So um, I'm glad that the, the sensory detail that you picked up on it and enjoyed it. As far as the character descriptions too, I think it was a, a a level of detail that allowed me to have the basics, but I can picture them how I want to picture them. And you know, I don't know if there's any plans for a movie, or I think it would make a fantastic like The Alienist or a, a yeah. mini series. So we'll have to we'll have to talk about that. But but like so you can see the movie in your mind of this story and fill in the blanks how how I wanted to fill in the blanks. So. I Absolutely. It. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, one of my favorite books, if we have any writers listening in Stephen King's sort of very classic book titled on writing, he talks about what you just mentioned that you give a reader two to three details enough to just say, do they have dark hair or light hair? Are they tall or short? But then readers, they have in their mind what they want to envision and they want to flesh that person out generally. And they're often going to relate that to someone that that the reader has known or or encountered in their own life. And that brings that makes more of an emotional impact for the reader as they're getting through the story anyways. So I think if you over describe a person or a scene, you're actually doing a little bit of a disservice um, because it's fun to let the reader kind of fill in some of those blanks. Well, that's, that's like one of the best parts of reading, I think. Yes. You know, that's, that's why we keep coming back. So, but I want to talk about our, um, your three main characters. So we have Nella, who is the apothecary. Mm-hmm. And then we have Eliza, who I think is a bit of an enigma, at least as far as I'm concerned. And then we have Caroline, who is our modern day woman. Um, of the three, do you have a favorite? And I also want to ask you too, did they, um, kind of spring fully formed from your head or did they develop over time or how, how did, how did these women come about? Cause they're all really interesting. 
Thank you. My favorite character is easily Eliza. She has been from the very first paragraph I wrote from her point of view. For anyone who's not read the book, Eliza is a really spunky, very intelligent 12 year old uh, who is interested in being the apothecary's apprentice. I sort of modeled her after my husband's niece, who uh, was about 11 when I was writing the story wicked smart, um, reads wildlife encyclopedias. And I, I imagined her when I wrote Eliza, just how smart and inquisitive she is. And she's also a foil for Nella. And when I say that, I mean, she contrasts a lot of the darkness and vengeance and pain that we see in Nella because Eliza is young. She has no baggage. She has no vengeance. Uh, she approaches life kind of with these rose colored glasses. So she was my favorite, um, absolutely to write. And, um, but interestingly, she was the third and final character to come to mind for me. Nella was the first, the apothecary. I mean, truly from the moment, the idea about this story sprung to me, I pictured a woman kind of hunched over at this old table at the back of a dark alleyway, a single candle lit on her table and she was brewing poisons and there was something very sinister about her. So that was Nella and she took shape very um, quickly for me. Caroline is very much modeled, I think after myself. So she's an American in London and she doesn't um, work in history but she has a little bit of academic exposure from her younger years. And so she's curious and she kind of goes on this, um, a little bit of a sleuth or a quest, you could say. And when I was writing Caroline, I often asked myself if this were me, if I were at the British library looking at this map, like I've done in real life, what would be kind of my next step? Um, so I had a lot of fun writing, writing that, that um, perspective of Caroline's. Now, there are certainly things that Caroline is encountering in her life, like her husband, and, and they're obviously having marital issues. Um, that thankfully is not a parallel. My husband and I are very happily married. Um, but I think that her being out there and just kind of seeing the city through her eyes, it reminded me of my first couple of trips to London and just being kind of so overwhelmed and impressed with the city. So that's a little bit of insight on each of the three characters, but uh, definitely Eliza was my favorite to write. And actually the reason um, originally it was just going to be Caroline and Nella, just the two timelines, but the reason why Eliza, I decided to write her perspective and she became so important to the story because of it. But the reason why is because in very early in the book, I'm not giving away a spoiler here. Uh, we see Nella sell a poison to Eliza and Eliza walks out of the shop with this poison in her pocket. And I asked myself at that time, I remember writing the scene very well. I asked myself, what would the reader most want to see next? And the answer was they would want to follow Eliza home and see what she does with the poison. They're not going to want to hear it secondhand. They're not going to want to hear a conversation later. Once the urgency of the moment is gone, they want to be next to Eliza side by side in that dining room with her when she dispenses the poison to her chosen victim. And so I thought, well, let me start exploring this perspective and see how Eliza feels when I'm trying to get her on the page. Um, and it worked out really well. And as anyone who's read the book knows, she's a pivotal role by the end of the story. She also, I think, um, you know, because Nella, as sinister and um, twisted physically, and I think mentally a little bit too, um, Eliza serves, I think, as, as a little bit of, of a redemptive character for her. You know, she calls forth things from Nella, um, maternal instincts, protective. And, and I liked that about Eliza, that her innocence and her freshness could do that. But also that Nella, you know, Nella's not all bad. And that was a very, um, I, I, it was a, a lovely relationship that evolved. That's one of my favorite things about the book is uh, the, you know, when Eliza first walks into Nella's shop, she runs her finger down the wall and all of this soot comes away 
Um, and beneath it is this unblemished stone. And then at the end of the story, the, the two look at the wall again and, and Nella kind of has an opportunity to reflect that, that that is basically what Eliza has done to her heart. She's kind of shown that there is this unblemished tenderness beneath a lot of the pain and a lot of the darkness. And she smiles um, for the first time in a long time when she and Eliza are having just kind of an everyday conversation. And to your point, there's, there's this motherly side of her that she wanted so badly to have um, earlier in her life. And now she's kind of getting this small window of opportunity to act as a, as a protector and a mother to Eliza. So there's a lot of ways that Eliza redeems Nella. And people have asked me, do you think Nella is a villain or a hero? And I definitely don't think of her as a villain. And I never did while writing her either. And I think Eliza sets out to prove that that's, that she's not a villain. Well, Eliza just, she just kept coming back. She yep. just kept coming back. <laughs> Very persistent. <laughs> So, okay, but even though Nella may not be a complete villain, she still has two rules. And rule number one is that poison must not be used to harm another woman, which does not mean you can't use it to harm a man. And rule number two, names of the murderer and her victim must be recorded in the apothecary's register. So talk about that. And if you could, some of the, maybe um, like the, the, the themes, I think there's, there's a lot of great themes in this book, women's friendship, vengeance, revenge. Um, but you also, I think, draw out the fact that there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of women who history does not remember. Yep. And, and you wonder like who went before us that was amazing and we just never knew about and will never know about. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So your point about women not being remembered by history is one of the key messages in the book. And that's really the value that Nella ascribes to her mother taught her, um, you know, women don't have a place in London that they can go safely without being appraised by a gentleman's doctor. Um, so this place has always been this apothecary shop has always been a haven for women um, but then take it even a step further. It also um, commits their names and therefore their worth to history because the, their names aren't going to be anywhere else and they're not going to be in genealogy charts, which I say that in the book as well. So that's just a very important um, value. And we see how important that is to Nella when midway through the book, she realizes that someone's going to try and use the poison against a woman and she throws away a day and night's worth of very tedious work because she refuses to partake in it. Um, your second, the second rule that you stated about all of the names that need to be in the register, that was um, that that serves a couple of functions. So one of the the main reasons why I wanted to um, establish that rule in the story is because I love big stakes when I'm writing a book. And, and I mean like conflict and what you can lose type of stakes. And so I, I couldn't help but think early on how terribly dangerous would it, would it be to have this single book with thousands of names of women who have bought poison and then also the names of the men that they killed um, and on what dates, like, just think if the police force got a hold of that, how many unsolved murders they could suddenly solve and know exactly who the culprit was and all of those women would be imprisoned and then killed. So that to me is stakes in a single book. Um, and so I knew that I needed Nella to have that register, um, and that that needed to be something that as the readers kind of following the story, they need to see that that register is at risk and that it might be captured and it might be exposed because suddenly that would mean um, the stakes in the story are much greater than just Nella. It's no longer just about her well-being, but about the well-being of thousands of women throughout the city. Yeah, it leads me to my favorite quote, my very favorite quote in this book. Nella says to Eliza, you cannot be betrayed by someone you do not trust. And that just jumped off the page at me because I thought, I think, I mean, it's so wise, but it's true. I mean, you, if you don't care what someone thinks about you or you don't trust the person, they, they don't betray you. Um, they can do whatever they want, but it's not, they're just being themselves or how you perceive them to be. 
So these women who are in the register, I think what comes across, at least in the stories of, that, that Nella flashes back to for, for, um, for some of them, and of course we don't know all the stories, but none of these women just set out to kill their husband, brother, mm -hmm. father, whatever, for no reason. Some damage was done and, and a trust betrayed. And then of course, Caroline is dealing with the betrayal of, of her husband. And those two storylines go in parallel, but I just thought that was just such a great, like that, those are words to live by. I think, you know, if somebody does something to you and you're upset and you think, well, do I really need to be upset? Is it that big of a deal? So thank you for that. But I guess I wanted to bring that out and see what yeah. your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I remember I remember writing so many different pieces of the book and that's one that I remember well and there's a there's a reason why I stated stated it that way. So, you know, what we see in Nella's flashbacks and in her register and in her memories are really I think adult natured betrayals. We're seeing affairs, infidelity, um, attempted murder. We're seeing things that a 12-year-old like Eliza would not and has not experienced in her short life. But what Nella or what Eliza's um, master has done is he has broken her trust. So she, I think she even says like she viewed him at, at one time as a father figure, like someone that she could feel safe with and um, was providing her with employment. And so I was, I was trying to think like, if I break down to its most elemental level, what these affairs and murders mean at the adult level, and let's just break it down, like peel away all of the layers and how could that impact a child? It's just one word and that's trust. She trusted him and even, you know, little two-year-olds trust someone. And so when you strip that away, that's when then you have betrayal. And that's a separate from any of these very adult forms of betrayal. Um, really, as soon as you can trust that someone's going to be, you know, feeding you and taking care of you, you can feel betrayal. And so that whole scene and, and why Nella says that is because she's trying to break down, you know, to its key, the, the root of the, the issue, which is um, trust. She's trying to explain that to Eliza in a way that would make sense to her. And just like you said, Kathy, um, we can't really be hurt by strangers. I mean, if you go to the store and someone says something that offends you, it may sting for like 30 minutes, but you're going to let it go. It's our friends and our spouses and our loved ones. They can say a single hurtful thing that we remember for years because we trusted them and we are hurt now by them. And so um, I wanted to, to portray that in the story. I, it was truly, it was one of my favorite quotes. It just jumped, jumped off the page. So thank you. Thank you for commenting about that. I know where the questions are rolling in. Um, before we get into the questions, I do have one question. Um, actually, I have a billion questions, but we'll let other people ask them for a while. Um, this is one of the most beautiful book covers I have mm -hmm. ever seen. And yours is a little bit different from mine. But did you have any input into the cover? And and um, in, can you just talk about it? Because it's just it's just so pretty. Yes. So first of all, in case anyone's wondering why they're different, Kathy, if you'll hold yours up again real quick. So the main difference, yes, it's the vial stopper. Um, so the, the Kathy is holding an advanced reader's edition, which I think we, we put those out uh, summer 2020 or so. So the one piece of the cover that was not determined at that point was this lovely three-dimensional prism vial stopper, which the art team, I think this was their fourth or fifth uh, version. And the moment I saw it, I was like, yep, that's it. Um, so to answer your question, typically an author has somewhat of a say in their book cover, but I was lucky in that, um, my agent, when she negotiated my book deal, she secured cover approval for the author, me, meaning that they really couldn't proceed until I, I signed off and said, yes, looks good. Um, now that said, it's a very collaborative process. We're all trying to achieve the same end goal. So the art team, um, they, the first version was very much the luscious, uh, rich colors. I mean, all of these blues and purples and pinks and yellows, those all existed. The vial existed, the little green beetle at the bottom, um, the, the kind of magical butterfly at the top. 
all of that existed. Um, however, there was a, a dragonfly right here that I said, let's nix that because there's no dragonfly in the story. Um, the butterfly was a monarch color, kind of a orange and black. And I wanted it to feel more magical uh, for Eliza. And so we had that changed to blue. Um, and then I think like some font, you know, they have obviously done some lovely embossing and this is raised if you sort of run your finger over it. So I'm glad Kathy that you ordered a hardcover because that's beautifully done. And I think you'll be very happy with it. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited because one thing too, that I do want to mention to people is that, um, and I'm, I, I think that there's even more detail, but at the back of the book, um, and especially for those of you who um, are looking for a really great book club book. This is, this is a fantastic book club book. I plan to, um, to use it at my book club, but there are recipes in the back and there are um, more detailed explanations about different kinds of poisons. And um, Sarah, is there anything else um, that, that my reader's copy might be missing? Um, I don't know if your reader's copy has the map in the front. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, yeah, this is probably my favorite part of the whole book. There's a beautiful map of London with, uh, let's see, 10 spots um, that are in the book and about half of them are fictional. So um, that's really fun as well. Oh, I love it. I love when they have maps with books. So. Well, I, I would just keep talking, but I want to give our audience a chance to, to chat with you as well. So Raya, do we have, I, I, we have quite a few questions. Um, do you want to start us off with some of the, the questions from our audience? Oh boy, we've got a bunch in here. I'm I'm actually, you know, gonna follow what our audience has voted for. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna ask you the most popular question first, and let's make sure we have time to get to some of these. For all of you who are watching, this is your last chance. Get your questions typed into the QA because we're gonna run out of time here. All right, here's one from Laura Mason. Hey Laura, thanks for your question. Laura wants to know about the research that you did on what apothecaries do and potions and elixirs and ingredients, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yes, Kathy, Kathy and I were talking about this before we actually went live on the call because I get this question so often and I was sort of telling her that I have books I can show and tell. So um, I'm just gonna grab them at random, but this is called Wicked Plants. And this is actually, um, this was published a few years ago. And this has all sorts of toxic plants and just descriptions um, and pictures like drawings of um, how they, well, where you find them, first of all. So what parts of the world, because I wanted to make sure that anything in Nella's shop 200 years ago would have been something she actually had access to. Um, so I tried to stay away from, plants that were just in North America, for instance. Um, but so it tells you where you can find them. Um, definitely. I was fascinated by the impacts on the body and the very, um, morbid details. So for example, Nux Vomica, what we learn in the story is that it can turn your muscles very rigid and make your, your spine kind of arch backwards. That has been very well documented in Nux Vomica poisoning cases. So I was fascinated by details like that. Um, so this is a really good resource, Wicked Plants. And let me grab a few more. Um, goodness, I'm breaking stuff. Um, this is called Poisoned Lives. This is by Catherine Watson. This is actually referenced in the back of the story. This is real poisoning cases in uh, England in the 18th and 19th centuries. So anyone who wants to actually read some nonfiction, and um, I think they're like 15 or 20 pages each. This is really interesting um, and talks a lot about like arsenic and some of the more commonly known poisons that people have probably heard of. And then the last thing I will show you, uh, which kind of relates to specifically to the question in terms of what an, what did an apothecary do? Uh, like what was a day in the life? This is a really obscure resource, um, but it's called grateful to Providence, the diary and accounts of Matthew Flinders, surgeon apothecary and man midwife. So this is one of two volumes he lived. Um, well, this is from 1775 to 1784 and it is truly, this was so fascinating for me, but it would probably be dry to a lot of other people. Um, this is his accounting logs. Um, oh. So this is what we would call like a firsthand primary resource, but it's been lightly edited. And then of course printed nicely 
Um, but he also like here, he's talking about a lunar eclipse um, and he's describing that. And that's in 1776. So, I mean, you're truly reading this apothecary midwife's firsthand accounts of a day in the life. And so we see, um, it's terribly sad. You know, he actually, his wife lost a child in childbirth. So he kind of describes that. Um, but these firsthand resources are just a gold mine for a historical fiction author, because you're not reading an interpreted or heavily edited version. You're actually looking at the firsthand accounts. So I tried to, um, access as many of those as I could get my hands on. Well, those are some great resources. And actually, um, for, for anybody who's interested, I think I have had a look at Wicked Plants. That is a, that is an excellent um, book if you're, you know, uh, if you're like me and, and you enjoy um, the slightly dark side of life. All right. Heather Hames has a great question. First of all, says that her feminist book club just read your book and loved it. And they all wanted to know something. So on for Heather and her whole book club, have you been wronged by a man in the past? Or if your storyline of targeting men is driven by general historical injustices? That's a great question. Um, a very personal one, in fact. Uh, I, can, I can answer honestly, though, that it's representative of I wish I had a really juicy personal story that I could share with you, but I probably wouldn't anyways. It's meant to be representative, absolutely, of um, crimes against women, general unfairness and injustice. And just as Kathy mentioned earlier, we don't see women a whole lot in history. And it's really unfortunate because there have been so many wrongs committed against women in history as well. And they kind of have been brushed under the rug. Um, not even kind of, they have, they've been brushed under the rug. And so this book is very much a way to show um, what might another resource or another avenue have looked like for these women who wanted to seek vengeance. Okay, Heather, go tell your book club. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I, I like thinking that it came from imagination, you know, rather than a result of experience. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, gosh. And it's, it's funny because I think some authors, um, you know, particularly in like the memoir space, that would probably be a place that, you know, you might want to share something that heavy, but for me, I don't know that I could have written some of this if I had been too close to it. And so to your point about imagination, I think there's something very freeing in imagining how one might feel or react um, people ask me all the time, like, would you ever poison someone? And I'm like, of course I wouldn't <laughs> like, I would be arrested. Even if I'm very angry with someone, I don't want to spend my life in jail. So no, I wouldn't poison someone. So it's funny. Um, you know, we do there for authors. A lot of us, I think there is very much a heavy veil that sits between real life and the, the stories that we're telling. So what other questions have we got, Raya? Well, we've got another question about research. This one comes from Denise Yarnevich, who wants to know about sort of how long it took you to do all this. So how long you spent on research and then how long you spent writing the book? You said it was your second, your sort of second attempt at publishing, but how long did that take you? Yes. So keep in mind, I was working full time in finance the entire time I was writing The Lost Apothecary. So I I was essentially doing two different jobs. Um, and so I would write between say 5.15 and nine in the mornings. And sometimes I'd pull a weekend or an evening revision stint. Um, so it took me about between my own drafting and then my own revision passes, it took me about 14 months to complete the story and send it out to agents. My agent, um, when we saw, when I signed with her, we spent another four months on, I think, three or four different revision passes. Then we sold it overnight to Park Row Books. And then my editor and I spent about another four months on revisions. So a book takes a long time to birth and to get where it needs to be. And then that's not even to mention, we, we then go to copy edits. And I think this book had four different copy editors and it still has two typos that went to print um, that we all caught way too late, but it's kind of, it's too late. 
So, um, it's funny, like, it doesn't matter how many times you've gone through it. Um, something's going to get missed, but I'm learning that I'm getting a lot faster as a writer. And I'm also starting to learn the benefit of outlining and planning the story, um, more, you know, taking the time up front before I begin writing to outline the key elements of what's going to happen. And that helps a lot with the writing And with The Last Apothecary, I didn't do that. I was still such a new writer that I just, um, we call it plotting or pantsing. You just kind of pants your way through it. That's what I did for the most part with The Last Apothecary. I I knew just a few basic pieces of information, but that makes for slow going and really, in my opinion, isn't sustainable for a career author who needs to turn books out more frequently. Um, so I'm quickly learning to become an outliner and I'm actually pretty pleased with how it's going so far. Well, gosh, that sounds like you've got something new in the works. Can you, can you tell us what you're working on or what we might expect as your next, uh, book? So, yeah, it's a, I always get this question. Um, and while I can't share a a whole lot of detail, what I can say is that, So many of the things people have loved in The Lost Apothecary. So the atmospheric historical setting, the brave and rebellious women, the cliffhangers and twists, all of that features in my next project and probably will feature in many, if not all of my future projects, because I I just like writing those different elements. And then the last piece um, is a speculative element. So in The Lost Apothecary, that is magical realism. And I'm kind of uh, running with a different speculative element in my next project that I'm not going to share yet. So um, I think that readers are going to love the next project. So can I ask you, um, do you think we'll see these characters again? Because there were, for me anyway, there were some ambiguities at the end that I was like, what's going to happen? Do you think they'll return to you? The ambiguities are purposeful. So um, it's funny. Some people, I, I was at a book club a few months ago and the, the women there were all so frustrated that I had left some open doors, frustrated in a good way, not in like a truly irritated way. Um, but they were like, what, you know, it, here were the, and I don't want to give away any spoilers. So I p- apologize for being vague, but they were like, here is one thing that we think might've happened at the very end, but it could have been this too. And my response to them was, if I wanted you to know, I would have just told you, like, I could have just resolved that in a single sentence. I didn't tell you for a reason. Um, That reason might be because I want you as the reader to decide. That's part of the fun of magical realism is deciding what's real and what's fictional. Um, And then also I want to leave the door open for future stories. Um, And so to answer your question, yes, Kathy, I absolutely think that there is more to tell about one character in particular. Um, I don't want to, you know, give away, give it away, but, um, there's, there's a whole door that I haven't even walked through with one of the characters. And I would absolutely love to continue that someday. That's not what I'm working on at present, but I definitely feel in my heart, like someday that story will come out. That's good news because I'll tell you, you know, this book takes some twists and turns and at the end I closed it and I was like, wait. And I had, I went back and reread the ending and I was like, Mm -hmm. what? So again, great book club book. Oh, yes. Lots to talk about. Absolutely. And speaking of great books, I think maybe, maybe our last question might be this one from uh, Jane Cahan, who wants to know what books you've read recently or ones that you just love and go back to. So it could be books by friends, classics, anything that you really love to read. Yes. I love that question because it's so fun, especially in the historical fiction space. There are so many authors um, putting out really good books right now. So the one that I just finished a few days ago is The Rose Code by Kate Quinn. Um, she was kind enough to blurb The Lost Apothecary and is also arguably the most well-known North American historical fiction author. So The Rose Code is about three female code breakers in World War II uh, at Bletchley Park and their romances and this big secret that kind of tears them apart. And then there's also a second timeline um, with the royal wedding in, it was whenever uh, the queen and Prince Philip got married. Um, I think the, the late forties, 1947. Yeah. So 
that's a very cool story and so complex. Um, so that was like huge five stars for me. Um, what I'm reading right now is the Paris wife, because I just watched this Hemingway documentary on PBS and it like shook me to my core. I'll admit I've never read anything by Hemingway. Um, and his style is a lot different than I think what I, I probably would like. Um, but as a writer and as a man, his life is fascinating. So I now am suddenly just devouring this historical fiction about the women in his life, life and, um, the Paris wife, I can hardly put it down. Like as soon as we end this zoom call, I'm so excited to go sit on my couch and keep reading this book. Um, so those are, those are two that are kind of, uh, on my list right now. And then, um, you know, I like to switch it up. So I'm reading also, uh, an advanced copy, um, author is PJ Vernon and it's called bath house and it's a thriller an LGBT thriller that comes out, I think June 20th. So that's wildly different than anything that I, you know, just mentioned. So I kind of switch it up. And I think as authors, we need to do that. Like we need to have diverse taste and just see a little bit of everything, both genre wise, author wise. And um, of course, one of my favorite classic authors is Wilkie Collins. Um, he wrote The Moonstone and that's a really just dense, complex mystery um, the woman in white is on my bookshelf behind me. And I'd like to read that, um, here shortly. So he's one of my favorite authors as well. So that's a little bit of contemporary and, and historical. Well, and one of the things that I do want to mention, um, before we let you go read the Paris wife is, um, your website has a lot of resources for aspiring writers. And I was really impressed by that because, um, you know, you don't have to do that. You could just have all about you and talk about events and books and, and, and what's going on with you. And even when I signed up for your newsletter, um, you said, you know, I'd like to hear about you. And I thought that was just so lovely. But you, um, to go back to the resources for aspiring writers, the one that I especially liked was the, um, the article balancing your day job mm -hmm. and your daydreams. So can you talk about that? Like, why did you decide you wanted to feature that on your website. Yeah, because I think so many creative people are in that, they feel stuck in that place where just like I described earlier, they think I've got to put food on the table for my family, but I also like to create and that doesn't have to be writing. Maybe it's violin or maybe it's watercolor, whatever. Um, but I think it's like a universal human problem that we need to be responsible, but we also want to have fun. And so that's why I described my own situation in that article you're referencing, how I, I ultimately um, found peace with, with doing both for a while, as frustrated as I might have been when I was at my day job because I wanted to be writing. I eventually kind of found peace and found actually a lot of parallels between the two in ways that my day job was benefiting my writing. And so um, that's why I put that art article out. Now, interestingly, anyone who follows me on social media will see that last Friday, I announced that after 13 years in corporate America, I left. So I'm now writing full time, which is a really exciting move for me. But I think to your, to your point about supporting other writers, it is truly the very least I can do after having been supported and lifted up for a decade by other authors. And I like to think of it as a ladder and there are people on rungs above you who are, they've got their hands down and they're kind of lifting you up. And then there are people below you and you've got to reach down and lift them up. And we all just sort of move up the rung together and there's no right or best place to be. Um, we all just kind of have to help each other. And so um, that's really why, why I've got those resources out there. And it's been so meaningful having writers reach out to me and just say like, thank you. Um, you know, you've encouraged me, you've inspired me like the, those are really meaningful messages and something I want to continue to do, um, as I progress in my own career. And you're also part of, I think you call it a writer's accountability group. <laughs> with um, Nancy Johnson, who wrote, uh, and I think her book is just coming out, The Kindest Lie. It came, yeah, it came out in February. So okay. Nancy Johnson wrote The Kindest Lie, and then Julie Carrick Dalton is the third member of the accountability group, and she wrote Waiting for the Night Song, which came out the first week of January. And 
Um, they're fantastic women, um, great authors. We've, we've all been supporting one another for about the last six or nine months. Our accountability group formed, uh, in the fall, um, or actually maybe a little earlier than that when COVID was, everyone was just feeling kind of lonely and craving human interaction and support. And I think, uh, I think in January, the three of us are going to finally meet in person at the Sundance film festival, uh, which will be really cool and a really awesome reunion finally. Um, but so I highly recommend both of their books as well. I have the kindest lie on order. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited. And then the Julie Carrick Dalton book, you said it's kind of an echo thriller. I think. Yeah, it's uh, the, the genre, they call it cli-fi, climate fiction. Uh, so it's about this, um, these trees that are dying and presenting a wildfire risk and um, set against a childhood murder mystery. And so as an adult, the character is kind of um, grappling with this mystery that she knows something about that she hasn't really been able to get off of her shoulders. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit with the time that we have left. And um, so I would be, I would be very remiss if I did not ask you about mudlarking, because <laughs> that was one of the things in the book that I thought, you know, like you can really go do that. Yep. And like I said, you know, your writing was so good. Like I felt the mud squish, you know, so can you, you, you went mudlarking. So what was that like? Yes. So I'll show you one more book idea um, before we log off for the night. So this is London and Fragments by Ted Sandling. I got this book for Christmas several years ago. And I, when I opened it up, uh, I turned to this apothecary jar fragment. And this is something that he's said uh, is mid 17th century. So this is something this author found in the river. Uh, that's what mudlarking is, by the way, I should say. It means uh, hunting the riverbed or any body of water for that matter. But in this context, we're talking the River Thames in London and searching for interesting or valuable artifacts that, that you might find. Something really fascinating to me is the River Thames, the tide rises 24 feet twice a day. So every time it does that and then it recedes, it's turning over that silt and that mud and uncovering really cool artifacts. You know, you can kind of see a sampling on this book. So when I started to write The Lost Apothecary, I knew I wanted a really creative entry into the story. I didn't want the character to find grandma's diary in the attic. I wanted like a really unique and fresh way for her to find the clue that sets her on this quest. And so um, it was about the same time that I had gotten this book. And uh, so I decided to have my character go mudlarking and that's how she finds the vial. And I did myself go mudlarking in the summer of 2019, which was the book was written, but we were revising it at the time. I did not find an apothecary vial, but I found all sorts of cool pottery and a little clay pipe and some fun stuff like that. So I would highly recommend it to anyone who visits London after lockdowns. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, all right. Last question. And if you can't talk about it, I understand, but do you think we'll see a movie or a TV series? Are you any? Is so any, yeah, and unfortunately that's another question I can't delve too much into. Um, but I will say this, I hope so. Uh, there's a lot of hoops that one uh, has to jump through in order to reach that level. And all of my fingers are crossed and I would love if everyone on the call <laughs> crossed their fingers. Um, I, I would, I would absolutely be delighted to see it. I think personally it would make a very good series or film. So we'll see what happens. All right, everybody. You have your <laughs> Cross, cross fingers and toes. Well, Sarah, this has been just a delight. Thank you so much for spending time with us and, and just telling us about this wonderful book. And I can't wait to see what you do next. And I, beyond that, I really can't wait to see what happens with the people from this book. So um, I, I can tell you that I'll be reading you for as long as you keep writing. Oh, and goodness. Thanks well, so much. For being thank with you us. so much, Kathy, for having me. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. I really, really appreciate it. So just a couple notes, um, folks, before we go, um, I want to, you know, again, thank Sarah and um, thank you to our host, Cromaine Library. And if you, uh, if you want to purchase The Lost Apothecary, um, check out please bookshop.org. Um, they support local independent booksellers. And if for some reason you don't want to go to bookshop.org, please um, patronize a, an independent bookseller. They need our help. They need our support. And they do just such a wonderful job. Um, 
if for some reason that's not feasible for you, check out your local library. Because one thing we didn't talk about is Sarah mentioned the British Library and all the great work librarians do. So thank you, Sarah. Um, your librarian will be happy to help you get a copy of, of the book, but please consider purchasing it on bookshop.org. And if you do, um, if you take our survey after the program ends, put your order number in there and we will send you a copy of a signed book plate from Sarah. So so I want to thank you all again for joining us this evening. Our next program is Monday, May 17th at 7. And we will be interviewing JT Ellison, who is the author of Her Dark Lies. And I just, I'm looking forward to that. Can't wait to see you. And so in the meantime, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, keep reading, and buy this awesome book. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Kathy. Take care. <laughs>